Shalom, shalom, everyone. This is uh, Rivka Reis, Chairwoman of Herut India. Welcome to today's webinar uh, on issues on Israel and Zionism. Uh, we have some new faces here, um, Keith, Kumar, from India, and uh, also we have the, the usual who are here, like Sora, Rishon, Einstein, our members of Herut India, and also from the diaspora, welcome. Um, before we start, some of y'all may not know who um, Lauren Isaacs is, so I'm going to do a short intro so that you will know um, who this speaker is. She's a good friend, uh, compadre. She's, um, she's a very, very close friend of mine and um, a co-worker in Zionism with Herut. So um, let me just tell you who she is, a short bio. Um, Lauren Isaacs is the National Director of Herut Canada and the Coordinator for World Herut in Israel. She has worked in the Israel advocacy field for many years as a Zionist yeah, activist. And public speaker. Lauren has made Ali at the age of 24 and currently lives in Jerusalem. Lauren Hello. young activist debunks harmful lies about Israel. Uh, Just a second. <laughs> Can you all please mute yourselves, please? Uh, sorry about that. Lauren Empire's young activist debunks harmful lies about Israel and effectively proves the anti-Semitic agenda of the BDS movement, both on and off university campuses, in the media, and as an unapologetic um, activist. She continues to split her time between Israel and Canada. Um, so now I, without much ado, I am going to hand over the show to my good friend, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Rivka. It's wonderful to be with Herut India again. Uh, Rivka, as everyone knows, is amazing and she's doing amazing Zionist work over on that side of the world. Thank God. And it's an honor to be here and, and to be your friend and just to know you. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to share my screen now with you guys. And let's see if this works. Everyone can see? Okay, excellent. All right, if, if you have a problem seeing or a problem hearing, uh, just uh, Rivka, you can text me or put it in the chat and uh, I will figure it out. But today we're talking about current events in Israel and modern Zionism. I actually want to focus on one particular issue, one particular problem that we have with a, a Zionist issue here in Israel. But first, let's talk about current events in Israel and what's going on. Maybe you've seen stuff in the media. Maybe you've seen stuff on the news. I don't know, but let's touch on a few important things right now. So first of all, this week, uh, Defense Minister of Israel, Benny Gantz, hosted the Palestinian Authority President, Mahmoud Abbas, in his home to discuss different issues. Uh, he claims he was discussing the economy, defense, security, and uh, international relations. Now, why is this significant? Why is this significant at all? It's actually very significant. First of all, this meeting was uh, the first time, basically, that the defense minister has hosted uh, the Palestinian president in Israel in 10 years. This is the first time uh, it's happened in 10 years. And this wasn't a public meeting. It didn't happen at some sort of, uh, in some sort of place, public location, some sort of Knesset. It happened in Benny Gantz's home. So Benny Gantz is the defense minister of Israel currently, and he invited uh, Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen, the Palestinian Authority president from Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, into his home to have a meeting about Israel relations. Now, is this good? Is this bad? Well, if you ask me, it's terrible. This is very bad. He never should have done this. And I'll tell you why. First of all, the fact that they claim to have discussed economy, but mostly defense and to fight against terror. That's what they were talking about, their relations in fighting against terror. Now, Mahmoud Abbas is the biggest current arch terrorist 
in existence in Israel right now. He is the number one enemy in my mind. I mean, yes, he's on par with some Hamas military leaders like Yahya Sinwar and uh, Ismail Khania in Hamas in Gaza. Yes, they are also dangerous, very big arch terrorists. But Mahmoud Abbas is uh, kind of the next, the successor of Yasser Arafat, who was the greatest, most dangerous terrorist, I think, in all time. Uh, of course, it's in contention that he's the greatest terrorist of all time. Mahmoud Abbas is a terrorist, make no mistake. The fact that Benny Gantz hosted him in his home, regardless of what the discussion was going to be about, regardless of whether it was about the economy or, or public relations or supposedly fighting against terror, which, by the way, is a contradiction. You can't talk about your uh, co-joined uh, experience in fighting against terror when he is the biggest terror. What did they have a discussion about? How they were going to fight against him? Mahmoud Abbas? I mean, it doesn't make sense. He is the biggest terror threat in Israel right now, and, and Benny Gantz hosted him. Why is this also bad in a public image? image way. It's bad because it makes Israel look weak. It makes us look ridiculous, to be honest. What other person hosts a, a giant glorified historical terrorist in their home, an Israeli official who's Mahmoud Abbas is currently claiming the destruction of Israel. He has a pay for slay policy. I'm sure you've all heard of the pay for slay policy, which is the policy of the Palestinian Authority, his organization, Mahmoud Abbas. He pays Palestinian terrorists to murder Jews. He also pays them if they attempt to murder Jews, even if they're not successful. Um, if they get arrested, he gives them a certain amount of money. If they get killed as a martyr, he gets a certain amount of money. So this guy is a terrorist through and through. The fact that Israel, an Israeli official, the defense minister, no less, hosted him in his home is an embarrassment. It's honestly an, an embarrassment about Israeli uh, uh, Israeli relations with the Palestinian Authority right now. What makes a good country? What makes a strong country, a defensible country? It's standing up and saying, no, we won't negotiate with terrorists. And there should be a hard line. I mean, inviting someone into your home is something personal. It's something, you know, you're welcoming a friend in. I can't believe that Benny Gantz hosted him in his home. I'm quite disgusted by it. And I think it's dangerous. Also, important to note, this meeting was not public completely. This was a closed door meeting. And for most of the meeting, it was just the two of them, just Benny Gantz and Mahmoud Abbas in a closed room with a closed door. There was no media and there were no cameras and we don't know what they talked about. I think it's dangerous. I think it's a, a disgrace and it's, it's a bad thing, but this is what's going on right now in Israel. All right, let's move on. There have been a lot of terror attacks in Israel recently. I'm sure you've seen it online, on Facebook, in the media. Of course, the media covers it in a very biased way. Obviously, if you're seeing these being reported by mainstream news sources, you're going to see words like occupation and Israelis using excessive force and lethal force and they harmed Palestinians and this and that. But the reality is there's an uptick in terror here in Israel, unfortunately. And it's a question that are we heading into possibly a third intifada? Are we at the beginning of a third intifada? As, as you all know, the intifada in the 1980s and then the second one in, in 2000, where there were um, mass uprisings of Palestinian Arabs who wanted to just slaughter Israelis in the streets. And especially in the second intifada, these Palestinian Arabs were very successful. They killed over a thousand Israelis in cold blood, just murdering Israelis, suicide bombings, knife stabbings, car rammings, gunshots, explosive devices. This was a, a thing that Israel suffered through twice already, officially. And it's questionable as to whether we're heading into a third intifada. Granted, our security measures are much improved now. Our defenses are very strong. People are aware. Uh, the international world would not tolerate it as much today, I don't believe, as they would back then, although that's also debatable. Either way, we may very potentially be at the beginning of a third intifada, maybe a third knife intifada. We've had a lot of knife attacks here in Israel, a lot of Arabs stabbing civilians in the streets, um, a lot of shootings. Now, these two gentlemen on the left, uh, may their memory be uh, a blessing, are two Jews who were killed recently in Israel in cold blood. They were killed for no reason other than the fact that they are Jews. Uh, Yehuda uh, Dementman and uh, Eliyahu K, young guys with families. Uh, Eliyahu K was uh, an immigrant, an Ole from South Africa at the beginning of his life, uh, you know, and they were doing nothing other than than standing in a place and and being Jews, and they were killed for it by these terrorists. And um, actually, there was just an article that came out in the Jerusalem Post that said Hamas 
and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is another terrorist organization here in Israel. There are a bunch of terrorist organizations, by the way. Don't get confused with all the names. You've got the Palestinian Authority and Fatah. You've got Palestinian Islamic Jihad. You've got Hamas, and you've got all the brigades, the military wings of all these organizations, and more. You've got Hezbollah in the north, and you've got Iranian proxies all over Israel. Anyway, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, that's one entity, and Hamas has said they are going to work together to increase terrorism against Israeli civilians. And uh, they've just come out and they've said that it was recent, maybe this week or last week. And there was an article in the Jerusalem Post about it, how they are going to work together to ramp up terror attacks. And their idea is twofold. One, to kill Jews. As usual, the, their modus operandi, the actual charter in these organizations' charters, they claim to want to kill Jews constantly, and that's what they intend to do. But also, uh, they want to work together to work against Mahmoud Abbas in a way, because these different Palestinian terrorist organizations don't all like each other. Sometimes they work with each other, like Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas, and sometimes they work against each other. Hamas and the PA, for example, hate each other, which is in ways good for Israel because they kind of cancel each other out in, in certain aspects, but they hate each other. But these two organizations say they're going to work together to A, kill more Jews and to B, uh, destabilize the Palestinian Authority. They want to take over. Hamas very much wants to take over Judea and Samaria, what you know as the West Bank. Hamas rules Gaza undisputedly right now. They are a theocratic dictatorial uh, terrorist organization that rules Gaza, but they also want to rule Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. They don't right now, the Palestinian Authority does, but if Hamas has their way, they would. Now, just last year, we were going to have elections in the Palestinian Authority, elections in that government for the first time, I believe in 17 years. Why at the last minute did the Palestinian Authority call off the elections? Because they saw that Hamas was going to win. The general consensus was that Hamas was going to win. So they called it off. They didn't want to lose power. And we can see that uh, I believe they took a, a survey. I believe it's something like 75 to 80 percent of Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. They would vote for Hamas. Uh, they support them. So we can see that Hamas is, is very close to taking over there, just like they did in Gaza. And we can't let that happen. We absolutely can't. Why we might not be right at the beginning of an intifada, please God, is because Israeli security is fantastic. Let's just take a moment to appreciate the border guards, Magav, the police, the IDF soldiers, everyone. They are fantastic. They're doing a very difficult job every day. They're out there putting their lives on the line to protect Jews and Israelis and everyone in the country, Arabs, Christians, everyone, protect against terror and to ensure a safe and civil society. They're fantastic. We love them. If you can see, I'm wearing my IDF sweater because I absolutely love them. So I do believe that they will protect us and they will keep us safe to the best of their ability. However, the terrorism is rampant right now. Make no mistake. It is rampant. All right. The uh, third topic I want to go on to, which is not uh, as much a, a hot button. It's a hot button issue, definitely, but it's not really in the media right now because it's an ongoing topic. It's a constant topic that's been here basically since uh, 1967. Arguably, we could say the, the problem has gone back uh, before that, but the Temple Mount is a problem in Israel. Why? Because it facilitates anti-Jewish discrimination. It discriminates against the Jewish people on the Temple Mount. Now, the Temple Mount is the holiest place in Judaism. A lot of people uh, think that the Western Wall is the holiest place, but it is actually not. The Western Wall is only holy because it's a wall that surrounds the Temple Mount where the two Jewish temples stood. Um, so King Solomon's Temple and uh, uh, Herod's Temple, uh, these are our famous uh, holy temples. And please, God, we, were, we will build the third temple in Yerushalayim very soon. And uh, anyway, so there is discrimination against Jews on the Temple Mount, unfortunately. And it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable because there's freedom of worship. There's freedom of religion. There's freedom of assembly everywhere in Israel, everywhere, save one location, except for one location. And that is on the Temple Mount. And that is uh, discrimination against Jews. Jews cannot pray on the Temple Mount. We cannot be openly Jewish. Jews cannot prostrate themselves, like bow down on the Temple Mount. Jews cannot say, uh, they cannot bring up a holy book, like a Siddur, a Jewish prayer book, onto the Temple Mount. And it is also illegal to wave an Israeli flag, to open an Israeli flag on the Temple Mount. Now, as you can see in the leftmost picture here, that is me 
a couple months ago on the Temple Mount opening said Israeli flag. <laughs> uh, you know me. Well, some of you don't know me, but if you know me, you know that everywhere I go, I carry my Israeli flag. I love it. I'm very proud. I'm very patriotic. I'm a Zionist and a proud Jew. I'm, I'm a religious Jew. And I believe it is not only my right, but my obligation and my responsibility to wave that flag of Zion of the Jewish people everywhere I go, especially in our holiest place on the Temple Mount. I did that. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you can see, <clears throat> the cop behind me in the picture on the left, he is coming because he is not happy. He is not having any of my behavior. He saw that I opened the flag. I only held it open for about 30 seconds, I'll be honest. And then the cop came over and I got arrested. Yes, I got arrested. The first time in my whole life I've gotten arrested. I've, ever, I've never been in trouble with law enforcement. Uh, I'm a good little girl, but I got arrested. And uh, you could see on the right-hand side, that was me when they were escorting me off of the Temple Mount after I was arrested. Now, they were very respectful. I will say the police were very respectful during the arrest. They didn't touch me. They didn't handcuff me. They're very careful about not touching women, you know, for religious reasons and modesty reasons, which is very nice. You know, even the, in the middle of, of an arrest, in the middle of me breaking the law, they were still respectful of my religion and my rights, which is very nice. Um, but yes, I got arrested. So we can see, and, and I'm still dealing with the legal troubles that have come from that we can see that Jews are discriminated against uh, on the Temple Mount, and it's very upsetting, and we need to change this. This is an issue that needs to be addressed, that needs to be talked about, that needs to be promoted, and that we need to make change for. Now, I want to uh, talk to you about other discrimination in Israel against Jews, because when we talk about discrimination anywhere in the land of Israel, it is only against Jews. And, and I know that the media presents it in the opposite way. And the media says, Israel is discriminating against Arabs or Palestinians or this and that or non-Jews. That's a lie. That is pure propaganda. It's all lies in order to harm the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Let me tell you the reality. The reality is that Israel is the most free, thriving, liberal, democratic, flourishing, wonderful country in the Middle East and in the whole world, in my opinion. Um, but there is some discrimination and the discrimination is only against Jews. Let's go through this. Here's a quick history. As you can see uh, the map, this is a uh, British mandate Palestine. All the yellow, all the dark yellow orange was supposed to be the Jewish homeland. This was all supposed to be the modern state of Israel. Today, we only have the 23% uh, uh, of that map to the left of the Jordan River. As you can see, you know what modern day Israel looks like because uh, the British uh, wanted to appease the Arabs who were unhappy with our allotment of Jewish land. And so they gave them all of Transjordan as an Arab state, which uh, could have been turned into a, a Palestinian state if they should have wished, but they did not wish that. Anyway, our land got cut and we now have what's left of the Jordan River, right? Now, in 1948, the British mandate ended. The British mandate meant that the British were just babysitting the Jewish land until the Jews were ready to govern themselves in the legally Jewish state of Israel, the legally Jewish homeland. And they knew that. The British knew that they were babysitting and they said, okay, we're done here. You can uh, take over. The Jews were ready to rule themselves. At that moment in 1948, when we got independence, uh, six Arab armies illegally attacked us from all sides, plus their allies from around the world. It wasn't just six armies. I mean, they had weapons shipments, arms shipments, people being sent in from all over, from all over the Middle East, from all over Africa, everywhere. Um, unfortunately, we lost some territory in 1948. In that war in 1949, people illegally stole our land. Jordan illegally stole part of Judea and Samaria, which they then called the West Bank. And Egypt illegally stole Gaza. Uh, now, doesn't matter. That, that's just a quick history. But in 1967, thank God, Israel liberated Judea and Samaria. What, what The name was turned into the West Bank, but I will refer to it from now on as Judea and Samaria. We reunified Jerusalem. We kicked out the foreign invaders, uh, the Jordanians. But in those areas that we liberated and reunified, we did not extend Israeli law over all those places, over all the places in Judea and Samaria or over the Temple Mount. And that was a colossal mistake in Israeli history. Probably besides the withdrawal from Gaza, the biggest mistake and, and the most damaging mistake in the history of Israel. Now, I want it to be known that when Jordan invaded in 1948 and the illegally stole Judea and Samaria, it was universally condemned. No one ever talks about this, but it's important to note that 
all member states of the United Nations at the time and all member states of the Arab League itself universally condemned Jordan and said, you should not have gone over the Jordan River and gone into Israel. It is illegal. Everyone agreed it was illegal, except Pakistan, which has its own bag of problems. We know that. And Britain also didn't condemn it. Britain created Jordan in the first place. So they were kind of in, in bed with them. Anyway, uh, the Jordanian occupation was illegal and it was condemned and the whole world at the time saw it as wrong. Since then, the whole world seems to have forgotten about it, forgotten that them stealing Jewish land was wrong. Anyway, we didn't do enough about this at the time. We virtually did nothing uh, because we didn't extend Israeli law when we reunified and reliberated and kicked the conquering Jordanians out. And that was our mistake. Now, why was not extending Israeli law a huge mistake at the time? Let me tell you, I don't want to cite the Bible. I'm a, a religious Jew, but I refuse to cite the Bible in this case because some people don't recognize the authority of the Bible. So we don't need to cite it. We need to cite the land, the land itself, legality, international law, binding resolutions. Land is an expression of a nation's sovereignty, plain and simple. This holds true everywhere in the world. So when Israel did not extend its law in certain parts of Judea and Samaria and on the Temple Mount, it caused three disastrous consequences. One, it was a statement to the world that we do not wish to exercise sovereignty in our own legal homeland. That's embarrassing. It set a precedent. From then forward, it set a precedent that we are okay with not expressing our sovereignty in our own land. Number two, it began the process for the first time of creating a de facto Palestinian state. We helped facilitate, create this de facto Palestinian state by not shutting down uh, these invaders at the beginning. We uh, sort of dignified their invasion by saying, okay, so we won't extend our law. Why? We should have dignified. These were invaders. These Arabs were from Jordan. They were from Egypt and they were from even further afield. We should have kicked them out and said, unacceptable. These illegal conquerors have no place inside our borders. But we didn't. And thirdly, it created legal discrimination, as I was talking about, against the Jewish population. Now, case in point, my arrest on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is a very plain to see, obvious example of where this discrimination happens against Jewish people. But there are lesser known places. People don't know so much about the discrimination in Judea and Samaria, for example, in what is called the West Bank. Um, now, let me tell you this. It's all very confusing and bureaucratic, but just so you understand, this is not super important, but just so you understand which laws currently govern the Temple Mount. Like, why can I be arrested on the Temple Mount for opening an Israeli flag? It's because military, uh, Israeli military governs the Temple Mount, but mostly with regard to security issues. So keeping people safe and keeping the peace. The Jordanian Waqf, the Jordanian police force governs the Temple Mount as well. And this obviously was derived from in, an illegal occupation. They shouldn't have been there in the first place, as we said, but um, they, they govern as well, which is why a Jew like me can be arrested for opening an Israeli flag on the Temple Mount because Jordan feels they have a right to arrest Jews for doing such things. Which laws govern Judea and Samaria? This is a little more complex and it makes for, as we call a balagan in Judea and Samaria, it's a mess for Jews who live there. It's very difficult for them because there is a hodgepodge of laws that govern there altogether. Ottoman land law still governs there. I'll talk about that in a minute. The Ottoman Empire, by the way, doesn't exist anymore. And yet their land laws are still in practice in Judea and Samaria. British mandatory law still exists there. They were a temporary babysitter. They shouldn't have been there in the first place either. Their laws still exist there. Jordanian law also, like on the Temple Mount, exists there. Jordan was an illegal occupation. And again, Israeli military law exists there to keep the peace. So in Judea and Samaria, modern day, what they call the West Bank. It, it's a mess of laws over there. Now, how does this manifest as discrimination against Jews? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at this. I'm going to show you three very quick and shocking examples of what we could call full on apartheid against Jews, absolutely blatant, disgusting discrimination against Jews in Judea and Samaria. Now, number one, this is a real document you can see here on the screen. Unfortunately, it's only in Hebrew. This is a document written uh, in the Supreme Court. We don't have translations in English, but I can send it to you if you want. And if you can read Hebrew, you can understand it. It is a Jordanian law, this document, and it is enforced by the Israeli Supreme Court today. 
It says that it is illegal to sell land, to rent land, or to give any property rights to non-Arabs. This is a Jordanian law. Why is this allowed? Why is this even in existence? Well, in Jordan today, the country of Jordan, they have Juden Rhine laws meaning Jew free laws. And I'm not making that up. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. The country of Jordan today has Jew free laws. No Jews live there and no Jews are allowed to own houses, own property, rent property. They are completely Jew free there. Jews cannot own property. So when they illegally came over the border in 1948 and stole part of our land, they applied their Jude and Rhine laws, their Jew free anti-Jewish laws in that land, in, in Judea and Samaria. And it's still upheld today by the Israeli Supreme Court. That's the part that boggles the mind, right? So they apply this on Temple Mount as well, which is why they can control when and how and where Jews come and walk and if we're allowed. But this law is currently enforced, unfortunately, against Jews. The second law I want to show you is called Tzav Shimush Mafria. This is just a, a transliterated from the Hebrew. And don't worry about the name. It means that if there is a dispute between a Jewish claimant and an Arab claimant about land ownership, there is a military order, Tzav Shimush Mafria, that will be issued to prevent the Jews from using that disputed land during the duration of the dispute. Now, it is a, a, an order that issues that explicitly claims the word Jews cannot use this land until the dispute is resolved. No such order exists against Arabs. There is no equivalent order that can be issued that says Arabs can't use the land during the dispute. It's only against Jews. If this is not the most blatant example of anti-Jewish discrimination, I, I don't know what is, right? This should shock you. It's despicable. Now, um, the last one I want to talk to you about is probably the most horrifying one. This is Ottoman land law, Article 78. As I told you, Ottoman land law is still applied in Judea and Samaria. The Ottomans were great conquerors. They were great invaders. They were foreign invaders. The Sultan came and, and destroyed a lot of the Middle East and invaded and took the territory for himself. His land laws are still in effect in Judea and Samaria, in parts of Judea and Samaria. Now, this law, Article 78, has cost the state of Israel hundreds of thousands of dunams of land in the past decade alone. That's how much we've lost. Hundreds of thousands of dunams of Jewish land, we've lost it to invaders. Why? Because Ottoman land law, Article 78, states that if you use a piece of land for a certain amount of time, the Sultan can give you land rights. You don't have to have the, a deed. You don't have to purchase it. You don't have to have a title to the land. You can just keep it. If you sit on it, if you squat on it, if you plant on it for a certain amount of time, the Ottoman Sultan will say, okay, you own that land. That's the Ottoman land law. He gave people these rights. Why? Because in his Ottoman uh, empire, he wanted to encourage cultivation and economy and he wanted people to grow the land. So he wanted them to just start owning land if they cultivated it. It made sense while the Ottomans existed. But now the Ottoman Empire doesn't exist. It's in the annals of history. It ceases to exist. So why are their laws still in effect? Now, this, uh, interestingly enough, this law itself was actually abandoned during the Ottoman Empire, before the Ottoman Empire even fell, which is funny because it is still enforced in parts of Judea and Samaria today. So if an Arab in Israel decides that he wants to take over a piece of land, all he has to do is plant on it. All he has to do is plant on it. He plant one single tree and that land then is no longer considered state land. It's not considered Arab land, but it's no longer considered state land. It is now in dispute. He doesn't, uh, it's called Ibud v'chazak, cultivation and possession of the land. That's the principle that this Ottoman land law operates under. So all an Arab has to do is plant one tree. Then the land is officially in dispute as to whether it's Arab or not Arab land. We got it so far, we're clear. Now, the question is, why can't Jews go out and do that? Why can't we go out and plant trees? Obviously our idea when we heard of this the first time and we were horrified, we said, fine, we'll get a thousand Jews together and we'll go out and we'll plant on every piece of land. No, it doesn't work because in 2012, the Supreme Court of the State of Israel ruled that Ottoman land law, Article 78, that grants these land rights can only benefit Arabs. Now, this is, I mean, <laughs> this sounds like a joke, but it's not. I want to throw up when I hear this discrimination against Israel and this active law that works to destroy uh, the legal ownership of the State of Israel. So if a Jew goes out and plants, our planting will be, A, it will be uprooted, 
and B, uh, will be brought before the courts uh, to discuss what needs to happen because it's just not allowed. It's just not allowed for a Jew to go out and plant on these uh, public land areas. Of course, um, there are ways to get around this. There are organizations around the world that buy big swaths of land, like shell corporations, uh, in order for Jews in a, in a loop-de-loop way to get land in Judea and Samaria, to be able to plant trees. I'm sure you know of the JNF, the Kakao, and other organizations that buy land, that plant trees. They're doing great things, thank God. They're working uh, sort of in loopholes and through companies and in different ways, but a private Jewish citizen can't go out and plant a tree, can't go out uh, or even purchase land in many of these areas. I can't. If I wanted to just go out and plant a tree on public land, I cannot. An Arab can, a Jew cannot. So that is what I will uh, end with with regard to the um, the legalities of the situation, because I know it's, it's very heavy. I gave you a lot of documents uh, and a lot of statements. I want you to digest it and understand how big of a problem this is currently in Israel. It's not being written about in the papers and they're not reporting it in the media. And we don't get a lot of attention around this, but it's our job to stand up, to speak out, to assert our rights and maintain that we are proud Jews, proud Zionists. We have a legal, we have a moral, we have an ethical, we have a historical, we have a biblical right to be here. And a, a not only a right, but a responsibility and an obligation to ensure that the world recognizes these rights. So uh, I will stop it there. I'm hoping we could have some discussion or interaction. I want to answer any questions you guys have. And that was just a bit about what's going on currently in Israel and about the, the ongoing issues. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, now we are open to, to the uh, participants. Any questions, any comments? Right. So are there any questions in the chat? Um, I didn't uh, see. <clears throat> Sandra needs a English translation of the of the law. Yes. So uh, I don't have the unfortunately, the Israeli Supreme Court believes in not translating their documents into English, uh, which is difficult for us who are not native uh, Hebrew speakers. I mean, I can read most of it, but uh, it's the language because it's legal language is very difficult. So they're only in Hebrew, but we could uh, give you a, a somewhat translation of what it says. Uh, that's the best we can do right now until they translate these documents. Please, God, they will soon. They should translate it into 100 languages. The whole world should read this and know what's going on, the realities in Israel and in the Supreme Court. I'm very unhappy with the Israeli Supreme Court. I do not like them. I do not believe they are good for the country. I do not believe they are good for Jews or our rights. It's an organization that I believe should be disbanded, to be honest, and then, you know, uh, uh, rebuilt from the ground up, but that's besides the point. Please, God, I will have translations of these documents soon. Um, sure, I can send you. I can send you the uh, the Hebrew. Uh, let me take. Also, what I'm going to do is here. I'm going to put my email for everyone in the chat, um, so you all have it, um, and then you can write to me directly. I try to answer all emails. Um, here we go. Um, um, and the, okay, so that's my email and my uh, social media. You can contact me through any of those platforms and I'll reply to you and I will send you uh, that document if you want. Um, and maybe you could get someone to fully translate it for you because that would be, that would be fantastic. But basically, yes, the, the discrimination against Jews in those documents is plain to see. And it's something that we're not talking about enough on the international stage. We're not talking about it enough here in Israel. So we really should be. <clears throat> and, uh, oh, okay, we've got a question. Uh, okay, the PA leader visit in Benny Gantz's home. How has this been seen from Israeli politicians? Ah, very good question. So Israeli politicians are very divided. Obviously, we have so many Israeli politicians, so many parties with so many different opinions. Um, but uh, basically, it depends on what side of the aisle you're on. If you're right, if you're left. Um, hold on. Uh, hold on. I accidentally uh, sent my uh, contact information privately. I didn't send it to everyone. Here you go. 
there, there, that should be uh, my contact information. Now everyone can email me and follow me uh, on social media and I will reply to you. Anyway, it depends if you're a right wing politician or a left wing politician. Basically, it hasn't caused an uproar. It hasn't caused any problems really in Israeli uh, politics. The right wing has spoken out against it and said it was a an abomination that it shouldn't have happened. And I agree with them, but there hasn't been enough noise. Mostly people saw it as a peaceful non-issue, right? They saw it as okay. Two leaders sat down civilly and discussed stuff peacefully. And that's great. Well, it's not so great, even though it was peaceful. And even though they sat down civilly, that doesn't mean it was great. It doesn't mean it should have ever happened. And it doesn't mean it's going to be good for the future of Israel. It's actually very bad for the future of Israel, but it has not caused the uprising that it should have caused. You know, if, if everyone was saying we absolutely should not negotiate with terrorists, this should have caused a big international thing. Oh, my God. Benny Gantz should have never sat down with terrorists. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. No one really cared. But uh, please, God, we will get more people um, to sit down. And then uh, Gantz need permission from Bennett or Lapid to do this privately. So that was actually a debate I was in with someone yesterday as to whether uh, he got express permission from Bennett to do this. Um, I believe he did. I believe it was sanctioned by Bennett. Obviously, Bennett is the prime minister and his party would have had to know about it ahead of time and would have had to give the go ahead, if not officially, then unofficially. Um, but Gantz is, is also pretty high up. He is our defense minister. Unfortunately, he doesn't have too many, you know, babysitters sitting over him, which he probably should have. Um, but he is allowed to make decisions and do things that honestly are destructive and uh, disappointing mistakes and whether he got express or explicit or, or quiet permission, I, he probably did get permission from Bennett who sanctioned this and it should have never happened. But that's why Bennett is also bringing a lot of problems in, in the government right now in the policies he's allowing, if not enforcing himself, the policies he's allowing. <clears throat> yes, I agree with you that Bennett is, I'll say he's weak He's weak, he's weak, and therefore weakness is the biggest dis destructive uh, element in Israel. It's, a, it's the worst characteristic we could have as a country, as a nation, because of our history, because of the fact that people generally want to destroy Israel. We are in a sea of hostile countries who wish the destruction of the Jewish state. Weakness is the number one worst trait we could show as a country, and Bennett uh, continues to show weakness and not assert our rights. We should absolutely unequivocally state we will not sit down with terrorists. We will not negotiate with terrorists. We will not acknowledge their existence. We will not negotiate. And unfortunately, Mahmoud Abbas was allowed into Gantz's home. He was welcomed into his home, which is uh, disgusting. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions? Lauren, I have a comment. Mm. You know, um, the, the Palestinians, the PA are horrible to the Jews, but yet, when Mahmoud Abbas wanted, uh, he needed um, health services. He had a heart attack or he had a, a health problem. He came to the Israeli hospital and got and got help. Just yes. look at how benevolent we are as Jews, you know. But they keep on killing us, you know. On the hindsight, it's 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 unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I know, I know. Um, we treat Arabs, uh, we treat Palestinians, we treat everyone from all over the country in our hospitals all the time. And as you say, we treat the big leaders. We've treated Mahmoud Abbas. We've treated Hamas military leaders in Israeli hospitals. Um, now, that's a whole discussion altogether as to whether we should be doing that. Um, but we do. The, real the reality is that we treat these people and the other side does not. Can you imagine a Jew going to try get medical treatment in Gaza? W what would happen in that situation? First of all, uh, we, we wouldn't even get in over the border because Jews are not allowed. And second of all, three seconds into getting into that territory, we would be lynched and beheaded and set on fire and raped and shot. Uh, and then they still would deny us medical treatment. So it's definitely a one way street. And this is, again, evidence of just an anti Jewish, anti Semitic uh, rhetoric that exists with uh, outside our country from the hostile countries, but also within from the enemies within. And that's what they are. The Palestinian Authority is an enemy, a grave, grave enemy. It's not only Hamas that we have to worry about. It's it's Fatah and the Palestinian Authority and Mahmoud Abbas as well. Very much. 
Um, Chris Edwards said something here. Why do people hate us? We have a long, painful history, but Lord God is with us. We are stronger than hate. Amen. Amen. That is that is true. God is with us. And uh, we are we are a miracle incarnate, right? Just being the Jewish people, just surviving for so long, the, our, our 5000 year history and then our more recent 3000 year history of people trying to destroy us. And the fact that we're still here and all our enemies are gone up until the modern day enemies, the new enemies, right? The Greeks are gone and the Romans are gone and the Byzantines are gone and the Turks and the Ottomans and, and the Muslim empires, the great, great Muslim empires who conquered these lands and, and destroyed us. They're all gone and the Crusaders are gone and all these places. We, we survived them. We outlasted them. We are a miracle just by our existence. And we will continue to outlast our enemies. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be aware and that we shouldn't fight and that we shouldn't be strong. But yes, we will continue to outlast our enemies, thank God, because we are the eternal Jewish people. Uh, excellent comment. Amen. Are there um, any other questions? Lauren, could you, could you expound on the GNF and the KKL just for for um the for the members to understand what it is all about sure. and how it helps us keep our land and you know um, excellent good, good question good point us, yeah. yes. Uh, they're, they're a great organization, the JNF and the KKL, mostly, uh, they're a, an organization for the Jewish people working for the preservation of land in Israel. That's mostly what they do. Now, uh, in 1950, actually, the JNF had an amazing project where they planted six million trees in Israel, obviously six million in order to commemorate the six million Jews that were murdered in the Holocaust. So uh, the JNF planted six million trees there and they continue to plant trees on a yearly basis. If you sponsor trees, if you buy trees to be planted as a proxy by someone else in Israel, mostly it's done through this organization, the JNF and the KKL. Now they also fund a lot of national parks around Israel. If you go to the national parks, the nature reserves all the way down from the Negev all the way up to the north to the Hermon Mountains, they sponsor most all the natural nature reserves and parks. And they have little signs that you can read about them and what they've done in those specific areas when you go visit those parks. But they are working for the... They are a good uh, organization to get in touch with. So they are a, a good organization that's, that's doing wonderful work. Thank God. Um, Thank you, Lauren. There's a question um, here. Uh, what about neo-Nazis in Europe and America? Excellent question. So unfortunately, I mean, the Nazis, uh, by and large, uh, Hitler's Nazis were destroyed, thank God, and they are gone as well, relegated to the dustbin of history. We survived, we thrived, and they are nowhere. However, there are still modern day enemies. The neo-Nazis are one example of modern day enemies of the Jews that we have to be aware of. The Islamic extremists, Iran is a, a big threat to Israel and the, and the enemies within uh, are a big threat to the Jewish people. These are all things the, the modern day enemies we're dealing with. But uh, as I said, there have been greater empires than the neo-Nazis. I mean, the Romans, a massive, massive empire that came in that destroyed our temple, that came in and massive and slaughtered Jews in the streets and crucified Jews and did the most horrible torture to us, they're gone and we outlasted them. So I think we have a good chance, please God, of uh, outlasting these neo-Nazis as well. But yes, them, along with the Islamic extremists uh, and Iran as a superpower, are, are uh, probably our, our greatest enemies today. Um, Lauren, what about U.S. and... Uh the uh, relationship now with the Biden administration, which is very lame, so to speak, uh, with Israel, because they don't seem to be giving much support now. And they are, you know, in a way wet behind their ears when it comes to Iran. Right. Yeah. So Biden is a threat in and of himself to Israel, Israel's sovereignty, Israel's defenses, and overall, uh, you know, Israel's right to live freely, peacefully, and in existence. Uh, that's not to say, uh, I don't want to say, oh my God, Trump was this and Biden's this. That doesn't matter. What matters is the policies that a, a president or a leader puts forward towards the Jewish people and towards Israel. Now, 
What Trump did, he did fantastic things for Israel. We cannot deny that. He stopped funding to the Palestinian Authority. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He acknowledged the Golan Heights as part of Israel. He did all these great things uh, that were true and that were real and that should have been done a long time ago. He finally put them into practice. It was good for Israel. What Biden has done has reversed a lot of those policies. Again, this is not me commenting on Biden himself. It's me commenting on his policies towards Israel. So um, the fact that he has resumed funding to the Palestinian Authority, he has literally resumed giving money to arch terrorists who claim in their charters, their official charters, their documents, claim to want the destruction of Israel, the Jewish people, and America. He has continued to fund these people. It's absurd. It's absurd and it shouldn't be allowed. And it speaks to the type of leader and the type of uh, uh, alliance that we have now with America. It's definitely worse. The relationship between Israel and America is definitely worse under Biden. I'll put it that way. Are there any questions? Comments? I see, I see Chris said, uh, commented on the Taliban. They are also our enemy. Yes, of course. The yes. Taliban is, is, is the enemy of a lot of people. Does the, the, the Taliban want to kill us? Of course. The Taliban pretty much wants to kill everyone who is not the Taliban. <laughs> uh, so they are a big threat in their immediate vicinity first and then uh, spread out. Their goal is to uh, bring everyone under the Taliban's control in the region. Uh, it, of course, kill all the Jews, kill America, kill westernization. But the Taliban is a huge threat to everyone. Um, did Gazans rebuild their safe shelters after rain of fire? <laughs> so I, I don't know what that question exactly means, but do you, <laughs> uh, the Gazans uh, have... Uh, the Gazans are con are controlled since by Hamas May. since May since May this year. Remember the pounding? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, thank God. Um, thank God. Listen, the Hamas controls all their infrastructure in Gaza. So we have no idea. Listen, maybe they're building buildings. Maybe they're not. They're probably not, to be honest, because the vast, vast, vast majority, probably 99% of the funding that goes into Gaza for the people gets funneled away by Hamas to use for terrorist uh, operations. They don't care about rebuilding. So when we destroy their buildings and destroy their weapons arsenals, which we should, it's amazing when we bomb their uh, places that have weapons and terrorists, they often don't rebuild. And there are a lot of piles of rubble there, which, uh, you know, that's their problem. It's not our problem. And uh, I think we should have done more personally in the last, uh, we could call it a war, we could call it a conflict back in May uh, in the summer when they started uh, firing on innocent civilians in Israel. I think we should have done more. I think we should have rained bombs down on them even more indiscriminately. But uh, please, God, they have not rebuilt their infrastructure for terrorists Again, <laughs> that's uh, that's what I'll say. Um, Ariella. How, is Canada, how is Canada's relationship with Israel? Yeah. Thank you. Excellent question. Um, Canada is pretty much like the U.S. Canada is kind of a, a younger sister of the U.S. and their relationships reflect that. So Canada is... An, an ally, officially an ally of Israel, just like America is officially an ally of Israel. What does that mean in practice? Do they actually help Israel when it comes down to needing help? No, they vote against us a lot of the times at the EU and the UN. They vote against Israel's right to sovereignty. They vote against Israel's right to building Jewish homes in Judea and Samaria. They vote against Israel's right to use certain amounts of force against terrorists. So they claim to be an ally. Why? Because it's Western, it's democratic. You know, it's modern. But in practice, are they an, uh, they're as much of an ally as America? They vote against us sometimes. They do not help us assert our sovereignty rights. Whatever. They're officially an ally, but the relations are good. You can travel between the countries. We have trade, but they are not Zionist. Let's put it that way. The relationship is not a Zionist relationship from Canada to Israel, just like the U.S. Um, excellent. I have a question, Lauren, and it's yeah. been, uh, I think about three weeks to a month back, there was talk about the Palestinian embassy setting up, being set up in uh, Yerushalayim. What is that? Is there oh, any, yes. any more news on that? Oh my God, that was a terrible, terrible t moment in Israel. And thank God that that has not come to fruition right now. It seems to have been stopped for now, at least the embassy being opened in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, has been stopped. Of course, there are still talks of opening up an embassy somewhere else 
for the Palestinians in Israel, which is also unacceptable. But um, yes, yeah, so there was this thing where Biden said uh, he would like to reestablish the American embassy in Jerusalem for the Palestinians, the one that Trump closed. Now, there's already uh, an embassy and a consulate in Jerusalem, and it gives services to everyone, to everyone. Jews and Arabs and Christians and Druze and Ethiopians and, and atheists and every, uh, however else you're identifying, it gives services to everyone. There should absolutely, unequivocally, never, ever, ever have another embassy opened in Israel, especially not for a people who are trying to claim that they want to, to, just, to destroy this land and take over this land. Obviously, their idea to open up an embassy is just another step in their process to destroy the land from within, to steal it from Jews, to make a de facto country within a country. It doesn't make sense and it's stupid and it would actually harm Palestinians more than help them. Uh, so no, it, we don't want it open. We will not allow that to be opened. It's absolutely unacceptable. And uh, thank God it seems to have been tabled for now. It's, it's put on the side for now, but I'm sure we will have to revisit it under the Biden administration. But I will keep you updated about that. Thank you. Einstein has a question. Why can't no. Israel do away with the Ottoman old era law? Can no new law overrule the old jinxed laws? So that's a great question. And that's like what we're trying to do. Organizations like Herut and there are other organizations that lobby the Israeli government. Uh, for example, there's an organization called Regavim. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, uh, but I will write it for you here in the chat. You can actually look them up. It's called Regavim, and they lobby the Israeli government, the Supreme Court, the Knesset to overrule these land laws. They want them abolished. They want the Ottoman land laws out. They want the, the Jordanian laws out. They want Jewish sovereignty and they want only Israeli law recognized in Israel. So there are organizations working towards it. Unfortunately, not enough people are working towards it. Not enough Jews around the world are raising their voices and saying, this is a problem. This is an issue that we want to address. Unfortunately, we're not making enough noise. And therefore, the Israeli government just doesn't care enough to mess with the status quo. They don't want to cause waves. They don't want to mess with the status quo. So it is how it is now. Please, God, there are organizations and people who will be loud enough to affect change and make them do away with these laws. I 100% agree with you that we should. It's high time that the Ottomans and the Jordanians and the British stop having their fingers in our, our country. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, but please, God, please, God, we are working towards it. Chris has a comment here. Canada and U.S., they both care about their own interest with Arab countries, I think. They don't really care about us. True. True. Very well said. I agree with that. <laughs> Santosh from India. New alliances between Israel and UAE. How it's been seen. Can this be considered a strategy move to bring peace around neighboring countries and to bring down the terrorists? Good question. Excellent question. Excellent question. So yeah, the, the new alliance, the Abraham Accords between UAE and all these countries that are moderates that have decided to normalize relations with Israel, acknowledge peace with Israel. That's great. It's amazing. And it should be going on more and more often now. Uh, some of these countries are being very brave and standing up and saying these things. Unfortunately, will it affect the terrorists? No, I don't think so, because the terrorists are living on another plane. They're living in another world. They are uh, extremists. They've been radicalized and they have one goal and one goal only. And that is the destruction of Israel, inclusively with the Jewish people. So I don't think any amount of peace, negotiation, offers, logic, relationships, other countries pressuring them is going to change that. They will maintain that. I mean, if you've read the Hamas charter, I recommend everyone reads the Hamas charter. It's readily available online. You can Google it. Um, it states the destruction step by step, how they want to destroy Israel, how they want to destroy the Jewish people. They're not hiding it. They make no qualms about it. They're not embarrassed about it. They're fully upfront. And they say, this is our goal, our mission, our existence is to destroy Israel and the Jewish people. So even though we're having good relations with these surrounding countries, I don't think that we're going to be able to get to these extremists. Thank you, Lauren. Are there any questions, comments? If there are any other questions, people can write to me privately. Of course, you can email me anytime, and I would love to hear from all of you.
Okay, we don't have any more questions and comments. Uh, perhaps it's time to wrap it up and the Indians can have their dinner. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you, Rivka, so much for having me and thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. Thank you so much, um, Lauren, for this wonderful, wonderful educational. Um, um, this whole thing is just amazing. It's amazing. And um, I hope next month we have another wonderful webinar, either with yourself or Karma or someone within, um, within um, our, our scope in, our, in Herut. Um, I also like to thank the Herut uh, trustees for coming on and supporting us and for everyone from a friend of mine, a new friend of mine from Malaysia, my birth country, she's here. Um, and uh, it's pretty late now in Malaysia, it's nearly 11. And all the, um, all the uh, uh, members of Herut, thank you so much for your participation. I believe you learned something today and Baruch Hashem. And thank you, Chris Edward. Um, very, very happy to see you all. Thank you so much. Laila Tov, have a wonderful, wonderful um, New Year, the Gregorian New Year, but still a happy New Year to you all. Laila Tov, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bye, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Take care. Hello. Thank you, thank you. Shalom. Thank you.